Okay, hello. Um, so, um, I'm just gonna um, go back to what I was trying to get through at the end last time, and then after that, I'll talk about the new material. Um, and I'm gonna write up again those, well, am I? No, maybe I won't. All right, so yeah, what I had written up at the end last time is still here. Um, this was point number four on my list of the four issues that Carnap was trying to solve at the same time. Um, right, so I spent most of the time last time talking about the issues in logic and set theory, and but also explaining why, at least in Carnap's mind, the issues in, that arose in logic and set theory, um, on the one hand, showed that uh, um, something was wrong with the language we were using to discuss logic and set theory. We were saying meaning, meaningless things and then trying to decide if they're true or not. And that's how we ended up with contradictions. Um, but also how in the other, on the other hand, it's, um, well, it's, I mean, to solve that problem, you need this, this hierarchy of different types of object. And that hierarchy um, sounds a lot like a traditional ontological hierarchy of different modes of being. Um, and so what I was starting to talk about at the end last time is what Carnap takes to be the moral of all that stuff for science. Um, um, and I guess the, the, the most fundamental moral is supposed to be that um, logic demands that science, uh, if, if it's a self-consistent realm of meaningful discourse, um, have this kind of structure where every object fits at a certain point in the type hierarchy, and they can all be, therefore, they can all be reduced to the fundamental level of the hierarchy. Um, right, so, uh, and, and so the, um, so to speak, the fundamental task of, con of uh, construction theory is just going to be to show how that can be done with all the concepts we actually use, that is, all the objects we actually talk about in science. Um, and again, I'm emphasizing this. Maybe I should write, before I go on to say more about this, I should write what the other one is. So the other one is that um, all the objects of science form an epistemically ordered Type now, I mean, I'm going to say a little bit more about what Carnap means by this kind of epistemic ordering or ordering by epistemic priority or primacy, right? Um, but, uh, but roughly speaking, it means that the base of this hierarchy is going to be um, 
something that we definitely have a right to talk about based on the nature of our own experience. So, right, so number one, we're not saying what the basis is. Right, as whatever you plug in for the basis, um, you know, the theory of types tells you how to use that to construct a huge hierarchy, but the theory of types doesn't say what has to be in the basis. And I mean, in, uh, um, uh, when you use it for the foundations of mathematics, you actually, uh, and this is what Russell and other people wanted to, to do, and what people, I guess, still do when they discuss the foundations of mathematics, um, is that you can do it with so-called pure set theory, which means that uh, there aren't any non-set objects on the, on the fundamental level. So, um, um, actually, I don't know, did Russell think he should, he could do that or not? I may be confusing Russell's approach with, with later Samuela Frankel approach. Well, any case, uh, be that as it may, that the, the theory of types itself does not tell you what, to, what the, the, you know, non-set or class objects are that you're going to start with. Um, so, um, but, uh, um, this second requirement or, or stricter or, you know, more specific requirement is that not only can all the objects of science be organized into a type hierarchy, but they can all be organized by a type into a type hierarchy. Well, first of all, with, you know, fundamental empirically accessible things at the bottom, whatever those are, and then such that being higher up in the type in the type hierarchy means being known on the basis of the things that are lower in the hierarchy. So that in a type hierarchy or constructional system with this kind of order, um, um, reducing an object to a lower level is the same as um, explaining how we can know that there is such an object based on things that are um, more immediately known. So, and I'm emphasizing that these are different. I want to emphasize to begin with that these are different because um, later on, and we're going to see a couple later stages of Carnap, um, uh, later on, he still wants both of these things, but he no longer uses the same system to do both. That is, he has one system that's set up for the purpose of establishing the unity of all science, and he has a different, like, kind of side system that's set up for showing that, that all the statements of scientists, science are empirically meaningful. Um, so these are, are really, you know, different. Uh, Carnap really wants both of these for, for different reasons, as you can see from the fact that he still wants to do both of them when at, later when, he, when they come apart. Um, so... Um, So, and I think what I was what I was kind of starting to talk about at the end last time, and I'll, I'll say a little bit more about it now. And it's and it's pretty important to emphasize, is that um, both of these are are like um, demands on what the language of science should be like, what the objects scientists talk about should be like. Um, 
Um, so, like, you could approach that by saying, so we're going to take these demands and use them to figure out what is science and what isn't. Um, that is to solve what Popper is going to call the demarcation problem, the line between science and everything else. So, um, so in other words, you could you could take the position that we're starting off not knowing what kind of fields of human discourse or whatever meet these criteria. Um, if any, and we're going to go out with the criteria and search and see, uh, like, okay, what are the things that are people are doing that can't, that look like that science that meet these demands um, that can be organized into uh, number one can all be put together into one type hierarchy, and number two can that can be done in such a way that it has this epistemic order. Um, um, but, and this is, I was talking about at the end last time, I think, um, that's not the attitude that Carnap is taking towards science. Um, rather, um, these things are tests that the constructional theory has to pass is the way he's looking at it. So instead of saying, you know, um, we know that science has to, you have to be able to do this with science, so we're not going to accept something as science unless we can do it. Instead, he's saying, we know that um, we have to be able to do these things with all the objects discussed in science. And so if our construction theory can't do it, our construction theory has failed, it needs to be fixed. Do people understand the difference between the two? I'm not sure that was 100% clear. Yeah, uh, can you repeat that one more time? Yeah, okay. So, I mean, the. I guess, like, I could kind of draw it this way. Let me erase these demands for now. And forget about what they are. You could, you know, so we have these criteria. And then science is supposed to match up to them. So, um, so there's two ways you could look at that situation. You could say, um, uh, so we're going to apply our criteria to everything out there, and whatever doesn't meet them is not science. So we're trying to draw a line between science and everything else using these criteria. But instead, what Carnap is doing is he's saying, um, we know what science is. So the test is going to be, so to speak, the other way around. Like, if if the way we're trying to, and so, I mean, maybe I shouldn't have just not said what the criteria are. It's, you know, the criteria is you have to be able to build a certain kind of system. Right? So the one way of looking at it would be to say we take everything, so to speak, and we select out the part that can be put into the, uh, our system, and we say that's science. But instead, Carnap's attitude is that we know what science is, and the question is whether the system we're working on can do it for everything in science or not. And if not, then there's something wrong with this. So in other words, like let's say it turns out that using the basis and the um, basic relation and the ascension forms and whatever that, that Carnap thinks are sufficient for this, um, 
it, it turns out that, you know, biological species or electron or, you know, some concept of science can't be constructed. So on the first way of looking at it, you would say, oh, it turns out that electron isn't a good scientific concept after all because it can't be constructed in our system. But, in, but the second way of looking at it, which is the way Carnap is looking at it, is you're going to say, oh, it turns out that that basis and that basic relation and those ascension forms and like that way of going at making this system um, is not sufficient because it can't get us electron, which we all know is a perfectly good scientific concept. So that's why it's a test for the constructional system and not a test of the scientific concepts. Was that clearer? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so um, right. So he says this in a lot of different ways, but um, like I think, on, for example, on page one hundred and sixty, in section one hundred and two. Page, oh yeah, I already said that, page 160 in section 102. The constructional system is a rational reconstruction of a process of cognition whose results are already known. We already know what objects we have to fit in, namely the ones that scientists talk about. How do we know that? We ask empirical science. What objects do you need to talk about? Um, and we're trying to reconstruct how those concepts are empirically meaningful. Um, and again, we'll see in the later development, I mean, I think this is, let me put it, this is like a real, uh, constraint as far as Carnap is concerned and the other logical positivists and the way you can tell that is because in the later history of logical positivism um, when Carnap and others become convinced that the technique of the Aufbau is not sufficient to get all the concepts that we use in science um, they Carnap and the other logical positivists change their position on what reducibility, what is required for reducibility, what is required for empirical meaningfulness, etc., until they can get a, um, understanding of those terms that does get in everything that you need for science. So it, it I mean, it really is the case that it's, it's, the results of science that Carnap is taking for granted and the procedure that he's proposing is being tested against that. Um, so, um, Okay, so that, that's a general point about both of those projects. Now I want to go back to the first one. The, the objects all fit into one hierarchy. So, I mean... Uh, if the objects all fit into this type of this system of types, um, then we must be able to tell. Oh, someone, uh, Mariana has her hand up. Um, yeah, I was just wondering because you know, as you say, Carnap is um, saying that is suggesting that you know, if a scientific concept doesn't work, if it doesn't seem to fit into the system then it's the system's fault. It's not really the scientific um, 
the scientific side of things. But then isn't one of the issues that science, like empirical, I mean, the way that modern science works is that the theories on how certain concepts, you know, some of those theories are always changing. So maybe, yeah, how does that fit into it? Wouldn't that suggest that actually is the scientific side that, that is at fault? Well, okay. I mean, so this is this is really important. The theories are always changing, but at least from Carnap's point of view, what you know, um, and this will turn out to be an issue, especially when we get to Kuhn. But from from Carnap's point of view, what that doesn't mean is that the old theory proved to be meaningless. So, um, although, uh, I don't know, is that, am I really getting at your question or not? I think, I mean, there's maybe two questions that could be separated here. One is, was it, since the theory is always changing, doesn't that mean it was science's fault that we said things that were false before? But I mean, and that's why, and it was an answer to that that I was saying, but we didn't, it doesn't show that we said things that were meaningless before. So, um, um, they were empirically meaningless. So, um, and the constructional system, again, remember, is about meaningfulness, not about truth. It's about meaningfulness of concepts, not about truth of propositions. Right, okay, I see. So, um, but I guess a different question would be, wait, we're, we're going to use the results of empirical science to decide how to set up the system, like what to use as the basis, what form to put the system in. Ray, what, uh, because, like, uh, well, I erased it, but how do we know about that epistemic order? Really, how do we know which are the things that we know more immediately and which are the things that we know only on the basis of those, by means of those? So, like, I mean, one approach to that is we know by pure reflection. We know by, you know, some kind of um, super introspective faculty. That's what Husserl said about this. Um, but um, Carnap really doesn't want that. <laughs> I think actually above all, that's what he doesn't want. So instead, the answer is, how do we know which things are epistemically primary and which are epistemically secondary? We know by the results of empirical psychology. So, um, right, so all the decisions we're making about what objects are going to get into the system, first of all, but also the order they're going to go in and everything else are all informed by these empirical results. If the empirical results are always changing, doesn't that mean we're going to have to change the system? And I think Carnap's answer is yes. <laughs> Right? I mean, he actually says lots of times that, you know, um, this area of the constructional system can't be worked out in detail because the results of empirical science are still not um, developed enough. So he's waiting for those to come in, so to speak, before he could work, he could try to even work on that area in detail. Um, um, so, I mean, that gets, that, that gets to the question, the thing at the very beginning I called what's up with this book, right? Like what's the purpose of the constructional system? Why do this? It's not to settle once and for all what the hierarchy of different object types is. It must be something else. There's some other purpose to, to to showing that we can do these things with the objects of science. Mariana, did you have your hand up again or you just didn't take it down yet? Oh, sorry, no, I just oh, didn't take okay. it down. All right, that's fine. Um, 
Right. So that was a good question. Um, all right. But yeah, anyway, let me, so let me get back to this. So, you know, there, so if the objects are going to fit into this hierarchy, it means we have to have, um, it means that the names of the objects should already be working the way Russell says the names of classes and relations and so forth have to work. Um, right, because what we're going to do is um, come in and show like um, how to explicitly set up an overall structure for the whole thing. But if the if we aren't already using these concepts in a way that allows of that, then that project is going to be hopeless. So I mean, so I think you know that's what's important. And I know someone was asking, maybe Ryan was asking about this at the end last time, about like the test for isogeny versus allogeny. So I mean, like. Why is this st that stuff even important? So, I mean, basically, yeah, Carnap is claiming that the way we already use in everyday life and in science, the way we already use concepts is such that not every name can be put in every um, argument position and every propositional function and get something meaningful. That's number one. So that's obviously necessary if we're going to be able to do this theory of types because the whole thing is based, right? I mean, remember, the whole thing is based on the fact that if A is, is a set and we have this propositional function, X is a member of A, but you can't plug in A here. If you plug in A here, you don't get something true or something false. Um, because if you allow it to be either true or false, you're going to get the Russell paradox, basically. So you don't get something that's either true or false. You get something meaningless. So if all the names that we're using in science are really names of sets or relation extensions, classes or relation extensions at some level in the hierarchy, then it must be the case that there's some argument positions in some propositional functions we can't put them into. Um, and um, yeah, I think the question was, so how does this work? We just look at it and see if we say, huh, that doesn't make sense. And basically the answer is yes, right? Because it, it should be possible to do that because we, sh again, we're like, we're, we're trying to reconstruct the results of a process. We're trying to reconstruct a process whose results are already known. We're trying to capture the way science is already talking about things. So the things that are going to be violations of the type hierarchy had better already look wrong to us somehow. Um, and Carnap at least claims that there's lots of examples like that, right? So like if you take the propositional function, x is located in Switzerland, Um, so, you know, if, uh, Fred is the name of this pen, then Fred is good in this argument position, right? I can say Fred is located in Switzerland. It's not true. Fred's right here in Berkeley, California. So, th so when we plug Fred into this argument position, we get a false proposition. Um, but that shows that Fred is an acceptable argument, right? We put the, we know how to put Fred into the function and get out a proposition, in this case, a false one. Um, but it, let's say I, um, instead I want to plug in aluminum. or aluminum. <laughs> um, so uh, I want to plug, but in America we say aluminum. So 
you know, I want to ask, is aluminum located in Switzerland? And the answer is aluminum is like a type of metal. It's a chemical element. It's not located somewhere. I mean, you can ask if a certain piece of aluminum is located in Switzerland. But I can't ask if aluminum is located in Switzerland. At least that's the reaction you're supposed to have. You know, I mean, obviously with something like this, you're, you're running a risk. Different people will have different reactions, you know, in, at least in some cases. And you're going to have to figure out what to do about that. Um, Carnap doesn't really talk about that in this book. But, um, but at least this case seems kind of plausible to me anyway. That, 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 that it's neither true nor false. Right? I mean, you, you, we wouldn't say aluminum is located in Switzerland, but the reason is not like the reason you wouldn't say Fred is, is located in Switzerland, namely that Fred is somewhere else. <laughs> you wouldn't say aluminum is located in Switzerland because it's not a question that it applies to aluminum. Or like maybe it's even clearer if I put in the number three, you know. Is the number three located in Switzerland? It's not true that it's located in Switzerland. I don't have to go to Switzerland to what? Whatever you would do with the number three. Think about it. <laughs> I don't know. But, um, uh, but it's not somewhere else. Right? So, I mean... Uh, so, so as far as that like initial requirement goes, things are, are relatively smooth. It's definitely true that there's some predicates that we think just don't really apply to certain things. Um, uh, so that it doesn't really make sense to ask whether, whether it's true or false that that predicate applies to them. And similarly for relations. Um, so, uh, right, I mean, if you, we could make this into a two-place relation by saying x is located in y. And then again, aluminum won't make sense here, no matter what y is. So, so, so far so good. The problem is that um, for, for it to be a type hierarchy, we require more than just this. We require that, um, that if two things can go, both go in a certain argument, then how can I put this in a simple way without using terminology like equivalence relation or something? We, this, this, this going or not going together, uh, um, this like sharing an argument position or not has to divide things unequivocally into types. So if, let's say, Fred and um, Zurich both make sense here, then they should both make sense. They sh then for any other argument of any propositional function, either they should both make sense or neither should, right? So because in that way, we can draw a line between these that are the same type and other things that are a different type. But in fact, at least the way we usually talk, this, this second thing doesn't work out. Um, right? So like uh, the example...
So like take these two propositional functions. X is located in Switzerland and X is red. So um, Fred and aluminum both could go in here. Right? It makes sense to say Fred is red. It's, Fred is not red. Fred is black and white. So it's again, it's a false proposition, but that's fine. Right? It makes sense. And it makes sense to say aluminum is red. Again, it's a false proposition. Aluminum is not red. It's kind of grayish. <laughs> um, but... Uh, um, Professor? Yes. Oh, uh, I'm a hand raised, but, um... Yes, that's fine. Um, uh, I have a question in the chat, but can you, like, talk about the difference between, like, a type and a sphere? Because uh, Harnap talks about how, like, the sphere is, like, logically defined, while type is, like, practically defined on, on page 65. But uh, I don't really know what that, uh, that, that means and how, that, how we're using it in, okay. uh, in this circumstance. <laughs> um... So, I... Okay, I... I let me see if I can figure out what you're talking about on page 65 first. Um, it's, it's the very end of a, of a not the very end, second, okay. second paragraph of section 38. Wait, on page, hold on. Second paragraph of, oh, sorry, that's 67, not 65. Oh, okay. Um, somewhere in this paragraph you're talking about? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like the very last sentence of that paragraph. It oh, says, okay. uh, we have already seen a differentiation of types, unlike, you know, that one. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. I know it. Right. So, I mean, so I think the, what he's saying there is, is this, that, um, he's using sphere in a way such that the same sphere could contain more than one type. Um, so, Right, like the you know, and the 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 big object spheres that he talks about, like the physical sphere and the psychological sphere and whatever, um, those each consist of a of a huge number of of different types. Um, so I mean, because I think sometimes he uses sphere and type interchangeably. Right, so you might say like the narrowest or smallest spheres are types, but other times he talks about much broader spheres. And what he what 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 he means when he says they're practically defined is that like what do all these types have in common? Not something logical, because logically speaking, we're just talking about classes and relations all the way through, right? So what all these things have in common, at least that's what he's saying. It's not actually clear that, that this is true, that this, the system has certain discontinuities in it, which hopefully I'll get to talk about one of them today. But, you know, but he's saying, like, why do we collect them all together? Well, because, you know, it makes sense for the same people to investigate them, right? Like, we use the same techniques with respect to them. Uh, so, you know, there's certain things that would be, make sense for, to, to test for in the physics lab. And there's other things that make sense to test in the psychology lab. They don't all belong to the same type, but they all go together for practical reasons. I think that's what he means. So, so the sphere is the practical um, unification of certain um, types under a single like discipline, right? Yeah, yeah, basically. I, I think, you know, um, there might be, he doesn't say this, but it seems like there might be also be different ways of dividing things into spheres for different purposes. Well, actually, we do know one example of that, 
which is a striking example, namely the difference between a system with an auto-psychological basis and a system with a psychological basis. So a system with an auto-psychological basis, the basis is my experience. And then, so the first sphere is the auto-psychological sphere, which is my experience and certain things that are constructed on the basis of my experience, like my sensations, my sense classes, my quality classes, whatever. And then from that, we construct the physical world. And then based on that, we take a further step and construct other people's experiences. So that gets us a different sphere, the heteropsychological sphere. So there's auto-psychological, physical, heteropsychological. But we can also, Carnap says, we could set up a system where the basis is everyone's experiences. And then on the basis of everyone's experiences, we construct the physical sphere. So there's actually like, well, actually, maybe this isn't a good example of what I'm talking about, though, because it's changing the whole constructional system. Wait, but is there like a, a logical rule for differentiating these spheres? Is there something like, like kind of like a rule, like a theorem I can use to test which spheres are, are, are which besides just, you know, the... the Testing. Yeah, no, I don't. I, I don't think so. But the, um, but I think it is supposed to be the case that that the spheres, although they're bigger than types, they don't cr cut across types. I, I I also think that the difference in spheres doesn't make a big. Well, does it or doesn't it? It makes a difference to Carnap, again, only because there is such a like institutional structure in the world and he wants to show what significance it might have and more importantly, what significance it doesn't have. It's not the case that the people in the psychology you know, building are um, studying something that's completely disconnected somehow from what they're studying in the physics building. Because they're they're both part of the same type hierarchy, or they or they can both there's various type hierarchies in which they can be arranged with each other. But however you do it, it will all be one system that's all reducible to one basis. So you know, so the introduction of these introduction of these sphere differences is is to connect that thesis to a, to points where we actually might feel a threat of disunity. I guess I would put it. But, you know, internally to the system, it, it, it's not supposed to make that, it's supposed to be continuous as you go from one sphere to the next, I think. So, right, so like if we introduce the term angry, so how would we introduce the term angry by, I'm kind of getting out of order here, but I guess, what are questions for, if not for throwing me out of order, right? So, <laughs> let, how do we introduce the term angry into the system with the, well, I guess I should say, in the system with an auto-psychological basis, how am I going to introduce the term angry for other people? Right, the term angry, when I say like, I am angry, that's going to be part of the auto psychological sphere. Um, but the question is, how do you introduce the term angry, which appear, applies to other human beings? How do I do that? And it's going to be something like, angry is the extension of the function x is a human. body that does and then we're going to fill in all the ways you can tell that someone's angry <laughs> or at least not all the ways but sufficient necessary and sufficient conditions for deciding that someone is angry Right, so like they raise their voice, they make a certain face, whatever. So all that stuff is going to go into here. 
And then angry is going to be defined as basically the class of all human bodies that are acting angry. <laughs> and then when I say something like, you know, Uncle Rudy is angry. I say Uncle Rudy is angry, I mean, or at least, I mean, within the constructional system, this can be reduced to Uncle Rudy, Rudy's body is a member of the class angry other people. And then that, in turn, can be, using this definition, can be turned into the statement, Uncle Rudy's body is acting in such and such a way. So you see, we got from the physical realm of like human bodies to the psychological realm of human emotions by just an ordinary constructional step. So the difference, like nothing happened when we crossed from one sphere to the other logically speaking. So, yeah, I don't know what else to say about that, but does, does that make it clear? Like, so, so, so these big object spheres, like I'm saying, like internally to the constructional system, they're not supposed to have any significance. They're, but, but they do have significance for us who are setting up the constructional system, using it, deciding if it's a good one or not, because they like refer to, to actual, to important distinctions we make in practice. I think, I think I understand, but is there, is there a, I, I just don't understand like the, the, the type difference. Like, can't you like see you do the same rule to translate types? How come like spheres are necessarily like logically, uh, uh, consi uh what's it called? It's, uh, it's like one big steer and some like matters the system, but types themselves have to be, like, you know, translate in a certain way in order to, you know, avoid any differentiations, uh, avoid any, like, meaningless statements. Well, the, you know, so, so, like, for the, I mean, I guess there's, there's, there's two answers, the two-part answer to that. So, number one, the way the theory of types avoids the contradiction is by strictly confining everything to a single type. Right, so we can't have any exceptions to that or else the contradiction may get back in. Right, like if there's any example of something where I can write this, then I can start distinguishing between the cases that are like this and the cases that are like that. And then I can construct the Russell set and I'll get the, the contradiction. So there can't be any exceptions. Um, so the, so the, the types can't be like vague or something. Everything has to be assigned to one specific type. And um, so that's one part of the answer. I said it's a two part answer. The other part of the answer is like the way we're understanding that, again, like the thing about Russell's theory of types is that it's not just supposed to be, okay, don't say this and you won't get a contradiction. It's supposed to explain why you really couldn't say that. And the explanation for that was that when we introduce these new symbols, we're introducing them as abbreviations for things we could already say in the old symbols. And um, uh, at least if you introduce new terms clearly and unequivocally, then it has to be clear which old symbols you needed for the definition and which you didn't. So, um, so that's that's the just you know. So, in other words, the theory of types. Uh, resolves the paradox by strictly separating different types, um, you know, assigning everything to exactly one type. And, but moreover, our, Carnap's understanding of why the theory of types is correct explains why that it works that way. Does, and, 
I guess, I mean, one reason I'm saying more about this than, than maybe is necessary to answer a question, I'm not sure, but one reason is that, like, some of the other ways of avoiding the paradox don't enforce, they, they, they still have, like, a hierarchical system, but they don't enforce this strict requirement that everything has to belong to one type, and, every, you know, it's more, it's kind of more cumulative. Um... So, uh, um, so this is like, I guess is connected specifically to a feature of, of Russell's solution, which again is the one Carnap, the only one Carnap knows about. And, but maybe even now Carnap might say, and yeah, it's the only one that's really justified. I don't know if sure, I'm not sure if I answered your question or not. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you, you definitely, I think I really understand. Okay, like, all right. The typing better. Yeah. So, um, right, so getting back to the example I was talking about before, I guess I've erased it now. Um, right, the two propositional functions were x is located in Switzerland. And x is red. And so um, thread and aluminum were both good things to fill in here. But whereas thread is good here, aluminum is not. So this seems to violate exactly what I was just talking about, right? Like. Are thread and aluminum the same type or different types? They can both be filled in for this argument, so they must be the same type. But only one of them can be filled in for that argument, so they must be different types. So there is no consistent way of assigning everything to types. So Carnap's answer to this is what he calls type ambiguity. Now, I mean, I think you could say type ambiguity is... Well, let me just question exactly how to phrase this correctly, but let me just put it the simple way first. So Carnap says, well, actually, is red has more than one meaning in our language. There's the way that a pen can be read, and there's the way that a chemical substance can be read. And although we use the same word for both, and normally it's harmless, nevertheless, it's not really the same predicate or the same concept that we're applying in those two different cases. So you can kind of see why, like, you might agree to that even if you didn't know all this stuff about the theory of types and what we're trying to do here, right? I mean, that the, the pen is red you know, uh, I mean, like, so you can ask certain questions. Like, if and I say the pen is red, you can say, well, is it red all over or does it have a spot? And if a white spot, and if so, how many white spots? But you couldn't really ask that about aluminum. Right? If I say aluminum is red, you couldn't ask, is it red all over, or does it have a white spot, and if so, how many white spots? Right? So, like, a substance being a certain color is not really the same thing as an individual, but, I mean, a substance in the sense of stuff. <laughs> not the, the, the philosophical, like, metaphysical term substance. Uh, like, a, a kind of stuff being a certain color is not really exactly the same property as uh, a specific body being that color. Although there's some relationship between them, right? Like, if the body is made out of that stuff and it's not painted, we expect it to be that color, the color that the stuff is, right? So there's a reason we use the same word for both, but maybe it's really true that they don't exactly mean the same thing. But I think, I mean, 
more importantly, from Carnap's point of view, like we're going to have to translate our language as if it had such an ambiguity into the constructional language if this is going to work. So we're going to, you know, detect this ambiguity perhaps in places where we wouldn't have said before that it was it was there, um, which is a little bit worrying. But anyway, that's the that's the that's the plan. Um, and it's and it's really I mean he says I'm taking note of a kind of ambiguity that's in our language that people don't usually notice. But I'm not sure if he's saying that exactly the right way for his purposes. The point is, it's like to make sense of our language as empirically responsible, we have to we have to distinguish between different senses of the same word, even where pre previously we wouldn't have said they were different senses. To I mean, not just to avoid contradictions, we have to do it. Um, I mean, actually, you know. So here's another place. X is made of aluminum. Fred is good in this place. Aluminum had better not be good in that place because if we are able to plug aluminum in there, then we're going to be able to get something like aluminum as a member of aluminum. Maybe there'd be two steps in between or something. This really means is made of aluminum. It really means it's like it's a piece of aluminum. X is a piece of aluminum. So Fred can go in here and it's false, but Aluminum is a piece of aluminum. Can't be right because it can't be either true or false. Because it would mean that aluminum is a member of a certain class of um, or relation extension, which is constructed out of the term aluminum. Um, all right. If that if that didn't make sense to you, just ignore it. The last thing. <laughs> Okay, are there more questions before I go on? Because I think I've said what I want to about type ambiguity and that stuff. Yeah, in fact, I think I've said what I what I want to say for now about this whole project. Organizing all the objects of science into a single type hierarchy. The basically like the way we the 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 test on whether we're managing it to do it correctly is whether we're able to like get the right results for what will go in what argument place and what won't. But there's a slight wrinkle to that, which is that we have to recognize a certain kind of ambiguity in our language that we might not have seen before. Okay, so there are, are there other questions about that? Okay, so because now I'm going to talk about the other project of epistemic primacy. A professor, Christopher yes. posted something in the chat. Oh, question in the chat. Thank you. Can you explain the? Uh, I can, but not yet. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, I'm hoping to talk about that at the end, if there's time. I hope there'll be time. Um, but uh, so, yeah, so let me try to say something about this as quickly as I can so I will be able to get on to that. I was in the middle of writing Epistemic Privacy. I think epistemic priority might be a more natural way to say this, but but in 
but Carnap does say, um, I think it's like Primaritet or something. He says something weird like that in German, so the translation is right. Uh, so anyway, um, so what does this mean? Um, And he, well, actually, I'm not going to read that, but he's, it's in section 60, 50, sorry, section 54 on page 88 is where Carnap says um, that um, our system form is going to be not just any constructional system form, but it's going to be a special one. It's going to be a one that's ordered by epistemic primacy. So, um, so like in any type hierarchy, when you introduce something on a new level by saying A equals by definition something like that. So, uh, you know, whatever is in here, is going to be a necessary and sufficient condition for the presence of an A, right? Like, as we saw in the example of angry, should have written equal by definition before, um, you know, X behaves in ways, blah, 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 blah. What we put in here must be necessary and sufficient for um, our ordinary statement, you know, that someone is angry. If it's not, we're not going to be willing to accept this definition, right? That is, we won't accept this as a translation into the constructional language of our usual term, angry because we would end up having to call people angry in the constructional language where we would say, but they're not angry. Or vice versa, we would have to um, end up saying that someone is not angry in the constructional system, but we usually say they are angry, right? So this has to be a necessary and sufficient condition for the application of the ordinary concept that we're trying to capture. Do people know what necessary and sufficient? Oh, there's a question here from Angelo. Is it an object or type? Oh, is an object or type only epistemically primary if it is relative to an ex epistemically secondary object or type? Um, yeah, so... Um, I guess you could say there's two, there, in principle, there's two ways to use epistemically primary, relative and absolute. So the relative way is, is what you're saying when you call something epistemically primary relative to something else. Um, the absolute epistemic primacy would mean the things that are not epistemically secondary to anything else. So they're the first ones. And that should be the basis of the system when it goes in this order. I'm not sure if I answered the question you had or not. Okay, so, um, um, right, so what goes in here has to be a necessary and sufficient condition. But in the, epistemic, in the epistemically ordered system, we make a further requirement that not only that this be a necessary and sufficient condition for this predicate to apply, but that this be a necessary and sufficient condition for us to know that this predicate applies. Right? So, like, um, you know, Carnap gives the example of the barometer and the air pressure. So, like, we could define um, high 
high pressure equals um, the extension of the propositional function um, you know, to what uh, objects the predicate high pressure should apply. But like x is a body. I'm sure we can't see the screen. Oh, sorry. Oops. What just happened? Oh no, it's frozen again. Okay. <laughs> I can't do anything. Um, I just have to wait for it to clear up. Uh, so this is going to be harder to follow if I can't draw it, but I'll but I'll say anyway. Um, hey, wait, Professor, can you actually repeat what you were going to say? Uh, what you probably said like the last ten seconds before it started cutting out. Oh, okay. So all right. So what I was going to uh, all right. I'm not sure how far back I have to go, but. I, what I was going to say is, in the epistemically ordered system, we require that what goes into the constructional definition not only be a necessary and con sufficient condition for the predicate that we're defining to apply, but be a necessary and sufficient condition. Oh, I think it's clearing up. Okay. Uh. For us to know that the predicate in, in question applies. And I was about to try to explain that using the example, the, the distinction there, using the example that Carnap gives of high pressure and barometer reading. So we can define high pressure as something like um, high pressure is the extension of this propositional function. X is a body of air. Where the barometer reads something, right? Reads greater than whatever, right? So that would be saying that high pressure is the class of, oh no, now it's out of focus. High pressure is the class of all bodies of air where a barometer, and I mean, there's some, there's going to be something bad about this definition because it's going to mean that only bodies of air that have a barometer in them can count as, as having high pressure. But I'm going to go ahead and define it that way anyway, <laughs> right? So we can define high, you know, high pressure as the class of bodies of air where there's a barometer that read that reads greater than so and so. And um, that will work because that's a necessary and sufficient condition for there being high pressure in that body of air, as we normally say. It. But we could also define um, body of air where barometer reads more than whatever as Right, so now we're, um, we're going to be defining the predicate is a body of air where the barometer reads greater than so-and-so. We're going to be defining that as the class of all things that are high pressure. And it's also going to work because um, this is a necessary and sufficient condition for that. This is kind of an example, but I'm starting to not like it. But I don't have a better one, so I'm going to keep going with it. Um, so this is also a necessary and sufficient condition for that. So we could go either way. And as far as construction theory in general goes, Carnap is going to say, yeah, you could go either way. And in fact, he discusses important examples of this, according to him. 
right? That you could construct physical objects on the basis of experiences because it's a necessary and sufficient condition for the object to be there that I have certain experiences. Um, but on the other hand, you could define, you could construct experiences on the basis of physical objects because it's a necessary and sufficient condition for me to have certain experiences that physical bodies do certain things, in particular my brain, right? At least according to Carnap. So you could construct one out of the other or you could do it the other way around. So both of these would be fine, but for the purpose of an epistemically ordered constructional system, only this one is good. This one is not good because we don't find out what the barometer's reading is by first knowing what the pressure is, and then from that concluding that the barometer must read so-and-so. It's the other way around. We find out what the pressure is by reading the barometer. So this, so, so this is a necessary and sufficient condition for this, but it's not a necessary and sufficient condition for us knowing this. Or to use Carnap's terminology, it's not an indicator for this. It's not an infallible and always present indicator for this. Whereas this, let's say, is an infallible and always, I mean, always present is already the problem, right? There isn't already, there isn't always a barometer. But anyway, Let's say this is an infallible and always present indicator for this. So what it means, again, is that it's a necessary and sufficient condition for us to say that that thing is there, but it's also how, in real life, we tell whether it's there or not. Um, or at least, and this is, um, so first of all, did people, actually, let me just stop and ask if people understood what I'm saying about indicators. Why, like, or, you know, to take the example I was discussing before, the, the, the important example for Carnap's point of view of physical versus psychological, right? So, you, like, you could construct my experiences out of physical objects. You could define, I, I could define the predicate angry as applying to myself as a certain class of brain states, And that would be constructionally okay because, let's say, you know, it, it preserves logical meaning. That is, it, you know, like, um, will make the same propositions true and false. Um, or to put it a different way, because it's a necessary and sufficient condition for me to be angry that I have a certain brain state. So, um, so that would be fine for that purpose, but it's not good for the epistemic order, right? Because I, I don't find out what my experiences are by examining my brain state, right? My brain state is just one of the many things in the physical world, and I have to find out all of, about all of them through my experiences. So for the epistemically ordered system, we can't go that way. We have to go the other way and construct, for example, my brain as a certain class of classes of relations, et cetera, et cetera, of my experiences. Namely, roughly speaking, like of all the experiences that count as experiences of my brain. <laughs> Most of us don't have many direct experiences of our brain, but uh, but nevertheless, at least if Carnap's system for constructing the physical world works, I'll be able to, to eventually include my brain among physical objects. Um, okay. Um, 
I feel like maybe this still isn't clear, but I really want to go on because there's important stuff I didn't get to yet. So, uh, um, well, actually, I said a lot of this stuff already because I went out of order. Yeah, so um, actually I'm going to now finally, this is all stuff I wanted to do last time. I'm going to, if there's no more questions at this point, I'm going to go on to discuss the reading for today, basically. Um, so, um, which is not as bad as it might seem because the reading for today is, I mean, um, So, like, there's a number of, of topics that, that turn up, important topics that turn up in the reading for today. Um, you know, one of them is, like, questions about how Carnap knows to dismiss certain things as metaphysics and why he's doing that and whatever. Um, another one would be, like, in what sense Carnap thinks that science is the, is our only mode of knowledge or like, like kind of scientism and what that means or doesn't mean. But fortunately those things are going to be better to discuss in the next lecture. So um, that leaves, I think as the main thing in this week's reading that all the details I'm assigning you to read about the actual constructional system that Carnap sets up in this book. Um, and, uh, so like the basis of that system is what he calls the elementary experiences. And there's, a, I mean, um, these elementary experiences are kind of a weird thing, uh, if we had more time, maybe I would spend some time talking about exactly what they are and why they're like that, but um, and what problems that causes. Uh, but I guess in the interest of time, I'll just say the elementary experiences are um, not individual sensations, right? Like a sensation of red in this point in my visual field or the smell of violets or whatever, they're, they're these whole experiences. Um, and it's um, something that Carnap at least takes to be a result of empirical psychology that those that, that our experience is really, really consists of these kind of unified simple states one after another and that it's actually by a later stage of processing but or of um yeah i guess processing i don't know if that's the right way to look at it although kind of does say that but anyway it belongs to a later stage it's not fundamental that our experiences are composed of all these different sensations occurring simultaneously. Um, as I said, I mean, that's an interesting theory in itself. It has uh, roots in various, especially 19th century roots. I think Carnap mentioned some of them. He's maybe not aware of all of them. Um, but uh, it's not that interesting for the purpose of this course, partly because uh, Carnap um, in later versions of the system first starts saying, or we could do it the other way, and then pretty much eventually just drops talking about these holistic elementary experiences. I, I, I think, you know, I think he thought it was neat that you could start with something so simple and he wanted to show that you could, but I, I don't think it's really important to anything else, whether you can or not. So anyway, that's the basis. And then there's only a single fundamental relation. Um, 
um, and I meant to assign the section where he says what that is, but I assigned the wrong section. It's really been section seven and eight. Uh, in previous years, I didn't assign it at all, and then I like made a note to myself, hey, you should assign section seven, but I wrote 75. I should have written 78. Anyway, it doesn't matter. The fundamental relation is something called re recollected similarity or remembered similarity, and it's the relation that holds between two experiences when um, um, I'm having one now, and I remember. Well, actually, it doesn't. I guess it doesn't have to be that I'm having one now, but it's. I guess I say when one of them contains also the recollection of being similar to the the other one. So it's a pretty, uh, um, I don't know what you could say. It's a pretty sparse basic relation. It doesn't contain a lot of information, very little. Um, all we start out knowing, according to this, is that um, some simple, unanalyzable, we, we, all we start off with is, so to speak, a list of pairs of elementary experiences. And it's going to turn out that that list of pairs is the pairs where the first one contains the recollection that it was somehow similar to the second one. And on the basis of just that, all the concepts of science are going to be constructed. So it's pretty ambitious. Um, uh, it doesn't really work out, as I've said many times. Um, there's even in the initial levels, there's certain technical problems that, that crop up. Um, and it seems that Carnap's constructional definitions won't work. Um, so uh, if something like this is possible, it probably needs a different basis and or a different set of fundamental classes and relations. Um, um, in any case, that's how the system actually starts off. That's the basis he actually chooses. After, and this is important, after pointing out that there's many other possible bases you could use, but he's claiming that this is the one that you want to use if you want an epistemically ordered system, because these are the things that are, that are absolutely epistemically primary, as I was putting it before. They're not constructed on the basis of anything else. That, I mean, sorry, we don't know them on the basis of something else. We know them immediately. Now that sounds like, I mean, that sounds like a strong metaphysical thesis. But from Carnap's point of view, that's something that can be determined by psychological experiments. So if psychology takes a different direction and shows that no, actually that's not what's most fundamental, then he'll say, oh, okay, we should construct the system on that basis. Um, although, as I said, I think in real, like really kind of subconsciously, so to speak, he's drawn to the idea that the, this would be the basis because this basis is so simple that it would be really impressive if you could do what he claims to do with it, right? Like if it turned out that what we know immediately is much more complicated, then it would be less surprising that you could construct everything else on that basis. But in any case, that's not officially part of the motivation here. Um, so the rest of the system, I actually told you to skip most of it. Um, you know, uh, not that I would discourage you from reading it if you're interested. As I mentioned, my initial encounter with this book was precisely that someone assigned only certain sections of it, and I was like, wait, I want to read the whole thing. <laughs> um, Ryan says, Carnap starts at sense certainty. Yeah, but it's actually in some sense a lot more uh, sparse than sense certainty. 
Um, but, uh, yeah, anyway, I mean, I assume you're assuming, I assume you're alluding to sense certainty in the phenomenology of spirit. Um, um, anyway, um, So, uh, and, but in any case, the reason I didn't assign all the details of the system is, well, I mean, a couple of reasons. Most, I think, both of which I've I've already touched on. One is that it, the the initial details are a are very technical and b don't really work. <laughs> so there's no point in you struggling to understand the details of them. And then the later levels of the system um, are. Uh, really just broad outlines. And Carnap himself says, and I did assign this part uh, in section, where is that, like section 150 or something, I don't know. Anyway, where he says, oh, like, by the way, you know, this constructional system is meant more as a tentative example of the idea that something like this can be done. But there's still a lot of work to be done on it, and we're awaiting results from empirical sciences. So in other words, Carnap himself isn't in any way um, committed to the details of the system. He's more interested in the idea behind such a system. Um, but there was one part, and someone asked about this, and now I hope I have enough time left to say something sensible about it, that I did assign some kind of weirdly detailed stuff about, um, which is the introduction of the, the world of physical things. So, um, like, first of all, this is really important. If I start with an auto-psychological basis, really important and really, like, worrying. If I start with an auto-psychological auto basis, Am I ever going to be able to introduce something that isn't just my one of my experiences or a property of my experiences? Um, um, so I guess you could say in this case that practical difference between spheres that we were talking about is huge. It's not just the difference between the physics building and the psychology building. It's a difference between things that are going on inside my mind and stuff that's out there in the world. That's a big practical difference. And the question is, can the constructional system get over that gap? And, you know, if it can't, it's obviously not going to get basically any of the concepts we use in science. Right? Because those auto-psychological auto concepts are not used in science, basically. Right? Science doesn't say anything about what I experience. It doesn't even know who I am. <laughs> so, uh, so, um, so this is an important and worrying step, number one. And number two, we'll see that this is the step that Quine says contains an error in principle. Right? That is not just that it wasn't done right, but that it couldn't have been done right. So I'm obviously not going to be able to finish talking about this this time. I'm, again, going to have to leave something over for the next lecture. But I'll at least start talking about it. So, so, so how does Carnap approach doing this? And the answer is, I think maybe um, you can understand this better. Like, imagine that our visual field was one-dimensional. <laughs> and we were, tr so it's just a line of, of, like, colors that we see and a line segment, right? Because it's just within a certain, right? So this is what I see at every moment. A bunch of colors lined up like this. And from that, let's say, I want to construct um, a two-dimensional world that changes with time. So I think this is something that's kind of confusing. This, this is section 126 through 128, basically, is what I'm talking about. So it's kind of confusing. Like, 
the, the world has two dimensions, but we're going to construct a three-dimensional system of points because the third dimension is time. So how do I do that? Well, so the idea is to understand this line of colors I see as, so let's like take this cross section out. And this cross section is uh, what? It's the entire world at one time, right? It's a bunch of points that are simultaneous with each other, but all in different places. So I'm going to take the, what I want to do is take the line of colors I see at a given time and interpret it as colors that lie in a certain direction in this space. So here's my visual field. Now, my visual field is not actually an object in this two-dimensional space, right? But I, I'm drawing it somewhere to show where, what we have to work with here, right? My visual, here's my visual field. I want to understand each of these points as corresponding to a certain direction. And I want all the directions to meet at one point, and the point they meet at is my point of view at this time. And the idea is that, the, you know, so like in the physical realistic language, as Carnap would put it, you can, you can say this. The reason there's a color, this color in my visual field at this time, is that somewhere along this direction, there's a physical point that's that color. Right, so like I see red on the leftmost position of my visual field because somewhere in, you know, in the very left hand angle of what I can see from my point of view is a point that's colored red. But if that, that's the wrong direction, <laughs> right? Basically, what I was just telling you is something like how I could construct my visual field starting with the description, a description of the two-dimensional world. Um, but I want to know all I have is my visual field, and I want to get the two-dimensional world. So the basic approach is this. I want to, so I start off with a three-dimensional space. My intention is that two of the dimensions are gonna be space and one is gonna be time. But I just, but all it is so far is just um, um, a coordinate system. Triplets of real numbers, which I'm thinking of as a space. And then um, I'm going to, so I look to see what my visual field is at each time. And somehow on the basis of that, I want to at each time choose one of these points as my point of view. And then also somehow assign the colors that are in my visual field at this time to points out here in this direction. And with the end that I hope in the end I'll be able to fill this two-dimensional world with surfaces. And there's going to be surfaces that I see at a given time. And those are going to correspond to the colors I see at that time. And there's going to be other surfaces that I can't see at that time, and I'm going to have to assign colors to those some other way. So that's the procedure. And he presents it as kind of an optimization problem. The way I go from this list of visual fields at each time to this two-dimensional world that that changes as time goes on, and also my point of view moves as time goes on, because I move. Um, the way to go from one to the other is to say, all right, um, I want 
to somehow assign colors to certain points in this three-dimensional space. Which way, right? There's infinitely many different ways to do it. Well, I want to make the assignment that best satisfies the following criteria. And then he gives a whole list of criteria. And the criteria basically amount to, like, um, the surface I'm seeing at a given time ha should have the right color. And beyond that, that the other points should be kind of like um, smoothly related to things that I see at other times. Right, so I should be able to say something. It, it will turn out, for example, that I see a different color at this time than I saw at this time because this body turned a little bit. And what that means in terms of the assignment of points is that some of the colors that are assigned to unseen points here were assigned to, 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 to seen points back here. And that, so that those points, as I'm going to later say, moved out of my field of view. And the question is just, you know, what's the best way of doing this? I find the best way of doing it. And then I define somehow a predicate like, um, or a relation um, R has color C between points and colors. I define this relation as the one that best satisfies all these criteria. Okay, I'm out of time, so I won't say more about that now, but like I said, I'll pick it up again next week, and maybe there'll be questions about that now, because I'm not sure what I just said was clear. And I will see you then. Bye.